So, if the brain is able to do this, it suggests it learned to do it. It suggests the intrinsic activity is based on connectivities that were uh, developed. And we can assume, perhaps, that the brain learned to build the alien world in the same way it learned to build the consensus world. There's no reason why it wouldn't do so. So, patterns of sensory data from an, an alien reality, if you like, over time, i.e. evolution, development, and experience, uh, would generate these connectivities, which would build the alien world as a default. Now, of course, that requires that the brain learn somehow to construct two different realities. Well, how would that work? Well, one idea were, is what I call parallel neural evolution. So if the brain was able to cycle between primarily serotonin secretion and primarily DMT secretion, so this is an ancestral function of DMT, I believe. I don't believe this happens currently. Um, serotonin is secreted during the day, and this is currently what serotonin does, and it locks the brain, if you like, into constructing consensus reality. But it also means that the consensus world, or the brain's ability to build the consensus world, uh, is, evolves during the day. Whereas, for example, at night time, uh, I suggest that probably REM sleep, its modern form of REM sleep, is probably not its original function. Uh, but when DMT secretion is ramped up, and serotonin drops down. Serotonin, by the way, does still drop down during REM sleep, but DMT is not ramped up. Uh, then that would mean that during the evening, uh, or at night when you're also dreaming, in fact, the, the, the old original ancestral dream state would have been a time when the evolution of the brain's ability to construct the alien world, uh, or the DMT world, whatever you want to call it, uh, would develop. Um, and so basically the brain has two parallel sets of connectivities. Um, the, what we're talking about here is some highly complex, finely balanced um, patterns of connectivity. And I think it's extremely important, the state of excitation of the pyramidal neurons that are uh, when these connectivities are developed. Um, and so when the connectivities that generate the consensus world as a default uh, were developed, serotonin was present. So the pyramidal neurons were at a particular excitation state. And we know, of course, if you shift that by giving LSD or psilocybin, for example, you, the connectivities become jumbled or you get a much more fluid um, and unstable and unpredictable state. Whereas when, of course, DMT was present when the ability to construct, or the connectivities that construct the DMT reality were developed, then when you replace DMT into the brain or through smoking it, what you're doing effectively is shifting the excitability of the pyramidal neurons to precisely where they were when those original connectivities uh, were developed. Uh, and so we have a clear neurological explanation of why DMT and DMT alone is able to, to shift the brain into constructing two completely different realities. It's not, uh, it's quite straightforward. You've got a simple network of excitatory, strong, weak interactions and inhibitory. And by changing the excitability of the, the whole system, you will change which networks dominate. Uh, and this is how I believe um, DMT works in the brain. So although DMT is no longer secreted in psychedelic concentrations by the brain, when DMT replaces serotonin, uh, when you smoke it in, high, in a high dose, um, the brain shifts from constructing sensory, sorry, the consensus world as a default, um, and the brain shifts from receiving consensus um, sensory data, so to speak, as a default. It rapidly shifts completely uh, into constructing um, this alien reality as a default, and possibly also allows sensory data from this reality uh, to modulate the intrinsic activity of the brain, which you wouldn't be able to do when serotonin was present. So, is this just is there any evidence for this? Well, one only really has to look at DMT to, uh, to see that it really does behave like an endogenous neuromodulator. Structurally, here we've got structure of dimethyltryptamine. It's very similar to serotonin. It's the simplest uh, of the psychedelic drugs. As a chemical pharmacologist looking at this drug, it's really unimpressive. It's basically got no chemical functionality of any note, uh, really. Even the amine, even the nitrogen, is masked by these kind of bulky methyl groups. Um, so it's two steps from, ser uh, from, from tryptophan, as is serotonin. So it's a very simple molecule, again, as you would expect for an endogenous neuromodulator. It's metabolized at about the same rate you'd expect for an endogenous neuromodulator, unlike other tryptamine psychedelics, such as psilocybin or mescaline, uh, metabolized within minutes. There's no tolerance. 
Again, this is completely unlike psilocybin or uh, LSD or mescaline. Rick Strassman showed this. Rick Strassman did the first studies in humans that were licensed, I think got funding from the NIH, and showed that you can have repeated doses of this drug and it doesn't exhibit any kind of tolerance effect. You get the same response every time. And again, you don't expect this for an endogenous neuromodulator. It's a substrate for the monoamine vesicular transporters. What that means is it's actively transported into neurons, it's actively transported into synaptic vesicles. Again, you'd expect this from an endogenous neuromodulator, of course. The lucidity of the experience, um, that Terence McKenna used to say, in a funny kind of way, doesn't affect the mind because you're kind of astonished that you're completely clear headed. So you would expect this, you wouldn't expect peripheral effects that cloud the experience uh, if it actually DMT in the brain had co evolved. Uh, for the brain to actually construct this reality. And finally, there is um, what I've termed a, a vestigial uh, sub-psychedelic secretion in the human brain. So currently the brain, as far as we know, doesn't secrete psychedelic concentrations of DMT. But I propose that it did. Uh, and that in fact, there is, has been some sort of decline in neural function where DMT is, is now only an ancestral neuromodulator. And so when you smoke DMT, you are actually reconstituting an ancestral function of DMT. Um, so I'll quit the summer and I'll, I'll say thank you very much um, for listening. Mm -hmm. monkeys, for example, have DMT-type dreams? Um, very good question. I mean, okay, well, I'm, my suggestion, I don't really have an exact time frame, my suggestion would be, uh, I guess, we often sort of banded around figures of 50,000 years or something like that. Um, what's interesting, if I can slightly uh, digress a little bit, uh, people always talk about the pineal gland and DMT. Um, there has been a suggestion that pineal gland secretes DMT. Again, there's no actual evidence for that. But what is interesting is that melatonin, which is secreted by the pineal gland, is a tryptamine. So it wouldn't take much of a, a mutation uh, to go from DMT secretion and melatonin secretion. Melatonin obviously has a very different function. But melatonin secretion is triggered by darkness. Uh, now, according to my model, um, DMT production will be triggered at night time. It's also interesting, when you look at some of the uh, Upper Paleolithic rock art, one of the great mysteries is, um, well, first of all, why are, they, why are they drawing or painting these images of half man and half beast, or these strange creatures that don't seem to be of this earth? People have suggested, well, perhaps they were on psychedelic drugs, and that's certainly possible. I think it may have been an endogenous psychedelic drug. One of the great or strange things about um, this rock art is it's often deep, deep underground completely inaccessible and in complete darkness. Uh, and that's kind of a mystery. Why would you do that? Why would you take a psychedelic drug and then go into complete darkness? But if, in fact, what was going on is they were going to complete darkness in order to, as a kind of an early way of stimulating DMT production, um, then that would explain why you go to somewhere where there's complete pitch black, because then it would trigger DMT production uh, in the brain. Um, so that's just uh, one idea. So th there could be evidence in rock art um, that's my, my answer. <laughs> uh, I guess um, you could consider the brain as a, an evolved organ, um, yeah. evolved uh, by uh, Darwinian evolution uh, to uh, facilitate our survival. And so uh, in normal consensus reality is one in which uh, we have the um, ability to sense danger, predators, uh, food supplies, and a mate. Um, but what would you regard the DMT world to be in terms of uh, a survival usefulness? Um, well, clearly, if I'm correct, then the brain has subsequently lost this ability. Um, so it obviously wasn't, well, not so that important. Um, but humans are pretty unique. In fact, we're all standing study as discussing DMT right now. Uh, it's always a testament to our creativity and our powers of insight. So perhaps 
I'm not sure, but DMT may have been responsible. It could have been a mutation that allowed the brain to secrete DMT uh, that gave humans um, our kind of special powers. But where did the elves get into survival? Um, well, I'm not saying necessarily, well, I mean, if, if DMT is allowing the brain to receive data from an alien reality, then you don't, you don't get to choose who's there. Um, so if, if elves are there, I mean, I'm not 100% convinced that you are actually seeing or that the brain is um, receiving any data, whether it's, this is some sort of, um, some, kind of, some kind of unconscious world, I guess, um, it's, it's, it's impossible to say. Certainly the parallels between experiences suggest that it isn't unconscious data, suggest there is an extrinsic component, because otherwise you'd expect very different experiences. But really, when you get to the very high doses, the experiences are very uh, disturbingly uniform, unnervingly so, I think. Do you think there might be any possibility for an intrinsic, within the brain, a neurological explanation as to why it is a intrinsic firing patterns on the DMT converge so much? Or do you think that it has to be outside the brain, that it has to be from somewhere else? Well, I can't see any reason why the intrinsic activity would construct hyper-technological alien realities as a default uh, in the presence of DMT or why the brain could shift. Um, so, no, I don't. I mean, I'm not against the idea that perhaps there is a a part of the brain or a part of the unconscious that is actually perhaps evolving in parallel and we're completely unaware of it. Uh, Jung spoke about autonomous complexes. Um, perhaps um, the DMT reality is actually evolving in all of us all the time and we never even notice it, so it's completely autonomous. And in fact, it may be evolving even at a much greater rate than we are. Maybe it's not you know, subject to the same constraints. We know that different organisms evolve at different rates and perhaps this world is evolving and maybe it only starts evolving when you're born, but by the time you reach the age at which you might consider smoking DMT, it's already progressed to this hyper-technological stage. I don't know, it's, just, it's such a fascinating topic to speculate about. Are you suggesting that there might be a correlation between um, uh, this effect and uh, reported alien encounters? Um, again, it has been suggested by a number of people. Um, I'm not 100% convinced. I mean, first of all, I don't. First, of all, we have to note there's no evidence that DMT is is kind of ramped up during these alien encounter experiences. But I'm not convinced that they are the same. Um, you know, people really what happens on a DMT, as I say, is complete replacement of consensus reality. It's not like you get elements of the DMT reality in your so you don't see aliens coming to the bedroom. Um, you are, for all intents and purposes, when you're watching you, you are not there. You like you're asleep, but it's all raging on in, inside. Yes, actually, that is my, my question as well. That uh, that molecule produces that specific effect. Could it be that the natural production in some kind of brain dysfunction could lead to that sort of experience? Um, possibly. I mean, that was in the the kind of. Um, in the 60s and 70s, people did look at schizophrenic patients and they thought maybe they have elevated, they have some sort of aberrant overproduction of DMT in the brain. But they found that actually schizophrenics and, and normal people, if you like, um, have very similar levels. There's no correlation between psychosis and DMT levels uh, in the brain.